welcome to our town hall meeting. Here is our agenda. Oh, it doesn't move. Why doesn't it move? Let's see. All right, here we go. So we'll first um, show you the current professional community leader group, which you all hopefully know. And then our new leadership. I'm, I'm really excited to present some to you. We will go over some membership statistics and then uh, some highlights for us as the pathology community at the Prague meeting. And then look a little bit into the planning, into our research webinars and so on. And then we will have time for discussion. All right. So here you see our current leadership. And um, you probably know them all. Myself, Greg Fischbein, Fiorella, Calabrese, Oksana Wallert, Federica Pesuto, and Annalisa Angelini. And here are our new leadership, with, starting with the Prague meeting. Annalisa Angelini will stay on as the representative to the board of the ISHLT, and she will also be our community chair. And then new to our leadership is Katarina Vasilev. She will be our liaison to the mechanical circulatory support IDN. Then Vanasi Sivasubraman, I'm sorry, Vanasi. Vanasi from Sydney, Australia. She will be our liaison to the advanced heart failure and transplantation IDN. Christina Kaufmann from um, Louisville in uh, Kentucky. She will be our liaison to pulmonary vascular disease, uh, so pulmonary hypertension IDN. And then Francesca Lunardi from Padua will be our liaison to the advanced lung failure and transplant IDN. Welcome to all of you. And thank you for taking on the responsibility and I'm looking forward to work with you. Then here are the data on the membership. And I don't know, Juliet, is it something you wanted to go over or do you want me to go over that? We have um, our membership representative, Joanne Singleton. She'll be able to explain. Oh, sorry, yeah, Joanne, welcome. Hi, hi. Um, so this screen just gives you an idea of the breakdown of the different um, uh, PCs and the percentage that each has of the total membership. So, so and this is, I'm sorry, I have dogs. Just going to apologize now. Um, so this just kind of gives you an overview of that. You want to go to the next screen? All right. So I just wanted to say, even though we are only 1%, I think it's very important for the ISHLT to have the pathology community. Um, this should give you um, a brief overview of uh, any the changes in the uh, membership of each professional uh, community as of 2023 and uh, 2022. So um, let's see where. You guys. So you guys grew last year. So that's um, great. So um, every incremental uh, change is a good change in, in the positive direction. Yes, we increased by 25%. Yay. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> any questions to that? Anyone? Any questions? No. Okay, then let's go on. I think um, that's yours too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm happy to take all these. So um, as many of you know, in 2023, that was the first year where we broke down our dues categories um, into physician, non-physician, and trainee. And then we also have it based on um, um, the economies of the particular country that the member is coming from. So we have a low, middle, and high um, income economy classes. And so what we're seeing here is um, a trend where we grew our non-physician category. Um, basically, um, the majority of the categories that we that um, the new membership types into grew um, from 2022 into 2023. So we're excited to see that this was a success um, and we're 
you know, encouraged um, by the growth and looking forward to seeing how this continues um, as we continue this particular program. And, and this is, as the note says, a way to remove financial barriers to those in the middle and lower income economies um, from not being able to be members. Right. Does anyone have a question to that? Because that is a pretty new concept. Yeah. Can I uh, make a question related to the uh, facilities for attracting people from uh, middle or low income countries? Is there a reduced fee to be members? Yes, there is a reduced fee. Yeah, do you know how much uh, is uh, the, the the fee for these uh, categories? Yeah, it just it depends on um, obviously whether or not you're training physician or non physician. Okay. Um, so on the membership page, I don't I don't have them memorized. Sorry, so I'm going to go to the website to get that information for you, and I'll put the link in uh, the chat box, and then everybody can go there to see what okay. the different uh, buckets are. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Jen, I'm and wondering, so, is there actually an active reach out to the low and middle income countries? Is someone actually uh, advertising so, actively to them? So there, it, we notified everybody. So previous to um, 2023, when everybody was kind of in the same classification, we did notify um, mem the current members and anybody that was in our system that the change was happening. Uh, so that if they did fall into those um, buckets, then they would recognize that they were now getting a lower rate, basically. So um, um, I don't know uh, off the top of my head what's been done um, since then, but the idea would be to segment the marketing according to what each um, person was qualified for and then give them the appropriate information based on that when they're renewing or wanting to join. Did that answer the question, Anya? Well, I was more, yeah, it's a part of it. I was mm -hmm. more wondering if we actively actually advertise to also people who actually don't know about it, who were not former members, right. really the people who may, who may now think about joining the ISHLT. Right. So it is, the, the information's on the website. I, I'm not sure about the outreach for marketing in that particular area, though. And I'm putting the um, link now for the membership page that has the breakdown of the, the rates in it too. So if you want to take a look at that. Very good, thank you. I think Annalisa, you had another question. I'm sorry, I think I cut you off. No, no, it was just to, to think how we can uh, attract people. Uh, my suggestion would be to uh, try to advert and uh, looking through the list of countries to see um, that are uh, uh, categorized as middle or low income countries uh, where they are located mainly and what we can maybe do to uh, specifically get in contact with pathologists there to try to include them or to attract them. This could be one of the target for the incoming year to look uh, particularly to these uh, uh, regions uh, and countries and see if we can do something particular. Can we have a list of these countries? Yes, it's um, based on the World Bank classifications of lower and middle um, income economies. And so that's also on the, that link is also on the page that I sent you guys. Okay. Thank you. So we have to go there and uh, check and see. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I let me see if I can pull a better list for you. Um, so we have to have something somewhere. This 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 project was worked on before I got here, but I'm sure there's a list somewhere that has that broken down um, easier by country. So I'll work on that now and have that finished your way. Okay. Yes, thank you. And I like the idea of Annalisa's to actually actively seek out pathologists from the low and middle income countries and maybe see if they want to join. 
Very good. Okay, let's move on. Um, all right. Yep, so this is just um, another breakdown to give you a view of the demographic um, locations of membership in ISHLP. Very good. Any questions to the membership from anyone before we go on? Okay. But this, then... Sorry, uh, Anya, is this uh, related to the pathologist distribution or to the all uh, HSL team membership? This is all overall membership, not oh. not TP specific. Okay, okay. But actually, that's a great question. Would be nice to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What it is I for think... pathology? Yeah, absolutely. Joanna, I was just going to ask from uh, the Southern Hemisphere point of view. I'm sure membership probably isn't. It'll be under the Oceania sort of Asia group. And we do have a couple of big meetings, national meetings, um, some of which cover Asia Pacific as well. Um, mm -hmm. And if there's advertising material that I can say for our, um, we have our national update meeting coming up uh, in three or four weeks actually. Um, and also we have our Australasian IAP. So we have the Lung Club as well in that. And if we had advertising material, I could take that along, um, maybe something to hand out uh, to okay. anyone who might be interested. Because um, mm -hmm. I know that we don't have as much representation um, from, and I, I, I see in the meeting we've actually got um, someone from New Zealand who I know, who which is lovely to have, um, who does heart mm -hmm. lung, Nikki Kingston. But we certainly would be, I'd be happy to advertise it from down here. Okay, that's that's amazing. So let me get with Jess Burke, who's our director of marketing, and um, I'll reach back out to you. Awesome, thank you. Fantastic, Manasi. Thank you. All right, so if there are no other questions, let's go to the next one. So these are the uh, professional community and IDN meetings in Prague. You can see here ours is on Friday, 6 p.m. to 7.15 at the second floor North Hall. And also we were thinking about another dinner for everyone who would be interested in going. Uh, to you actually offered that she would help me with organizing a dinner. So I don't know what people think, what their best day, night would be for dinner, right after our pathology conference, or do you have other ideas? Or maybe the night before? What do you guys think? Last year we did it uh, right afterwards, right? Yes, we did. But I, I think that... it was Thursday last year. That worked out relatively well because, you know, we all walked together. Um, so in terms of transportation and finding the place, it might be easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have a quick question. Um, I know from last year, I don't think that's really an option, but is there a consideration for a virtual um, option to attend um, the IDN from remote remotely? I know the setup is not, wasn't quite good for it last year, but I'm just wondering. Juliet, Joen, could you answer that question, please? There will not, not be a virtual um, option for those who can attend in person. So. Thank you. Okay. All right. So let's go to the next one. So these are these are the webinars, and um, our webinar is on March first, and we will, I will have a short word about that on the next slide, just for your information. I don't think the advertisement has been sent out yet. Juliet Jen, is that correct? Because I haven't seen it. That's that's correct. Um, it's usually sent out. Um, about 10 days before is when we start promoting. Oh, hey, Craig. Um, that seems a little late because people have to put together their schedules, right? Yeah, um, I'll double check that. Um, let me see. It should be listed already on the on the schedule. It's live on the website. Yeah. 
Yeah, but uh, if can I make an advice? I think 10 days is uh, the right time for the people who already know that there will be the, the webinar. But uh, I think uh, why not one month also uh, a remind one month earlier. I mean, just to let people organizing in advance. Yeah, it makes sense to get that out as soon as possible. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree with that, Annalisa. Yeah. yeah. Because calendars fill up. I post reminders on Connect, so um, so I'll keep up with that. Um, oh, so it's already been posted? Yeah, it is on, on Connect uh, in the event field, but I'll go ahead and um, make an official um, posting and then right. um, yeah. keep up with reminders as it approaches. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and you. when you say you do a posting, that will go out as an email, correct? Yes. Correct. Yeah. That would be great. Thank you. I see it's listed under the online learning um, section of the website, too. You just have to go to the um, second page. Yeah, you know, I think that's the problem. Who goes to the web page all the time? Right, <laughs> right. That, uh, we probably yeah, should, but, you know, yeah. it's, yeah, very good. Okay. So here we come to our 24 planning. And so there are several um, documents in the planning and they were on the um, what send, uh, what uh, Megan Barrett had sent out where they are looking for volunteers and the deadline is today. One of the documents which will be headed by Annalisa and myself is the um, is the guidelines for processing explanted native and allocraft lungs and hearts. And I know many of you already sent us emails. My understanding is you also have to send an email or you also have to reply to the official ISHLT call for volunteers. And whomever you reply to us or reply to the ISHLT, we sent already and we will repeatedly send an email invite to our in-person meeting, which will take place in Prague the first day of the meeting on the Wednesday at 7 a.m. in the morning, room club C. And then there is the other document, the standards and guidelines documents, which goes through the um, um, lung transplant IDN. And I think Fiorella, you are involved in the leadership there. Is that correct? Could you just yes. say what to that, please? Yes. Uh, yes, I'm working with the co-leaders. The co-leaders are David Young, Glenn, and the two pulmonologists, Glenn uh, Westall and uh, Deborah Levine. The, all uh, uh, been decided by the SNG committee. Um, and we are going to finalize the follow-up uh, application format. We surely will submit uh, it by the deadline. <clears throat> They fixed the deadline. Sounds good. <laughs> good. You know, interesting that you say that because Annalisa and I, we had already submitted our application, but of our follow-up application. But of course, we didn't have the volunteers from the ISHLT yet because the deadline is today. So they, they actually called us back and said, wait, wait with the follow-up application. So, all right. Uh, any questions to these guidelines? So please get involved. Please volunteer to be involved. We can use every input uh, that you can provide us with. Uh, okay, so. Now, we really wanted to take the, um, the uh, opportunity to talk about our planning for 2024. And that includes the follow-up on research projects we had talked about before. And then, oh, wait a second, there is one missing here. Oh, here, I skipped that, and the symposiums. So even though we didn't have the 2024 meeting, 
we should think about, we should start thinking about 2025 symposium proposals because the deadline I assume will be in June. Usually I think it's June 1st. So please think about um, symposium proposals and uh, start planning on those. In regards to the webinar, our March 1st webinar, maybe Fiorella, you wanna talk something about it because it's your idea. Yes, yeah, so we have um, already shared with the, the discussant and the speakers the, the topics. So uh, I think we this was a, a previously presented as a clinical pathological conference, uh, um, Duke Padua uh, conference. Uh, so we are in a good um, in a good uh, in a good state. So I think we could have a, a realignment webinar uh, next week. Uh, um so i think um I, I i don't know if there is a elizabeth here in in the I'm here. among us because elizabeth is a, is a speaker together with the pulmonologist they will uh, talk about the uh, light and shadow of elderly recipients and the case will be presented by a young fellow uh, that could show some triggers useful for the discussant uh, pathologist and pulmonologist to discuss about light and shadow of, uh, of uh, uh, elderly recipients. So I think it, it will be a nice webinar, surely a nice webinar. I put a link to the advertisement uh, in the chat. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you will be very interesting. But the the young people, people, young people as Francesca, Federica and the other young are already sharing by social this uh, this webinar. And this I think could be more effective than other uh, type of communications. That's fantastic. Yeah. All right. Uh, the other idea for the webinar, I think Oksana, I have seen you too. Do you want to say a few words about this since yeah, that's uh, your idea yeah actually yeah that would be a webinar we are planning uh, for infection diseases in the transplant setting so i'm going to complete uh, the form and it will send to the committee for approval and that's i don't know when but it was a uh, plans for later in the year we don't have dates for that yet correct that's correct yeah yeah so this is for the new leadership also to know that this uh, webinar is actually cooking. So you're already one step ahead for, ah, okay. for that one. Great. I think uh, the, I don't know if the idea is uh, to plan this webinar uh, end of May, beginning of June, just before the summer. Uh, or if you think we, we would prefer to postpone the meeting the webinar. We were planning also to reach to the infection uh, diseases community for joint speakers and to have a joint meeting uh, that will allow uh, to have more participants uh, will be more of interest, not only to pathologists, but to the mm -hmm. clinicians as well. Yeah. So I think maybe uh, for that, uh, more time would be better. Uh, if we have more time to to accomplish that that task as well, yeah, I think in June could be a right time. Yeah, I would suggest the June before the the summer vacation. Yeah. I think we have uh, enough time to contact uh, people and also taking in mind that we have also uh, the meeting in Prague, so maybe also in person if we need to to make uh, some final a decision or finding uh, some speaker missing. I think we should have enough time. Yeah. I would force a little bit to to stay on uh, the, the planning for June. I would agree with that because first of all, then the summer months come and September is pretty full with pathology related meetings as well. So then we are already talking about October and then yeah. it's almost almost Christmas. So yeah. uh, so June would be would be good if if possible, Oksana. Is, um, okay. Oksana, are you 
in charge of uh, contacting the infectious uh, disease uh, 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 I, I, no, not really i think uh, one of us was planning to i think uh, uh, anja was planning to get in touch with them yeah once i have the once yeah. i have the um, okay. you know the design yeah. and everything yeah. i do know someone in microbiology and um would be happy to do that okay very good and then we are always open for other ideas so if you have a good idea for a future webinar please bring them on maybe someone has already an idea anyone Um, do you know, Anya, the, the outcome of our previous symposium? How was the? Because uh, do you remember this was a, 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 an idea just to, to submit as a webinar uh, some um, previous uh, symposium that were not accepted? For the, so at the meeting. Oh, do you mean how many of our symposiums were accepted? Yes, because no. we submitted we submitted five symposium. I remember as a pathology yeah. community. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think uh, I don't know. We I, only one or two have been uh, successfully yeah. accepted. Yeah. The other could be uh, presented as webinar. For example, this could be an idea. Yeah, or adjusted know, as yeah. a webinar. Uh, adjusted yeah. at least as a webinar. Yeah, yeah. The topic so actually and... also ours. Uh, Oh, sorry. Sorry, Annalisa. Go. Oh, go no, ahead. I was oh, just. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm can... moving. <laughs> sorry. No, just the the symposia. We can go through and see uh, the topics and uh, how we can uh, change uh, from a symposium uh, structure to a webinar. Maybe with uh, inclusion of cases or uh, young people presenting more um, attractive or flexible than a traditional symposium. But uh, I think, Anya, you should have all the symposia that we submitted. I, I do have them, I'm, I'm pretty sure. And I will maybe contact everyone who submitted one because um, okay. the, um, the program chair, he wrote me and um, Basically, what he said is that they did not take a single complete proposal, but they took pieces out of it. And mm -hmm. I think everyone who submitted a symposium got the email back, what was taken, what was not, or if the proposal was rejected completely. So I will contact everyone who actually submitted a symposium, and then we'll go from there. It's a great question, yeah. because I do not have the data on that. Okay. Yeah, can I um yeah, the you're sub, if you submitted a symposium, you should have gotten an email whether your symposium was accepted in its entirety or partial or not accepted at this time. So it, the email will go to the one who submitted the symposium. But I think I, mean, I think I didn't send to mine. Oh Go ahead, Annalisa, go ahead. Uh, no, uh, usually we try to go through the professional uh, community. So we, we not just a single uh, submission, but we, we try to go through sharing the proposals uh, between the, the leadership uh, group. And uh, so I think uh, if I don't remember wrong, uh, Anya, you should have at least some of the proposals that we discuss with Greg also, I remember, and and see what oh, we can take from, from that. Yeah, all the proposals that were shared, I should have them because I usually save them and um, yes. okay. we'll go from there. Great, great point. Yep. I, know, know, I think I didn't send to mine because mine was last minute, so I can send you this one as well. That okay. was with the radiologists, the MRI people for the right heart failure. So um, I think they have taken something similar, but not ours. So, but I can send it to you. That sounds great. And we also could do another webinar, like the bring your own case, where we uh, present cases and uh, we discuss the cases 
if we want to. Just a, just a proposal. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, Nahia, I have seen you too. Nahia really took the lead on a... Um, on a manuscript that was submitted to JHLT Open Access because they had um, this program where if you submitted an article until December 31st, it was for free. Otherwise, JHLT Open Access charges for for any um, you know for any sent in manuscripts. So Nahir, could you please talk a little bit about it? Sure. Um, some of you may remember that I had sent an email just um, uh, for those that were interested in, in writing this uh, manuscript on, it's, a, it's sort of a review of the pathologic findings, mostly in cardiac allograft vasculopathy with um, also what we know so far in lung and proposing a unifying nomenclature for the diagnosis um, with the idea that if we do this, then we, it, it'll be easier going forward to study these entities and sort of expand our knowledge particularly when it comes to the lung, where, where it's actually very limited what we have out there. And um, so uh, some of you responded, and I think it ended up being like seven or eight authors. Um, and we worked hard, and we were able to actually submit it in time um, to the uh, to the J uh, JHLT Open. Um, unfortunately, they didn't make it in, but they did have some good revisions, um, mainly to expand the lung pathology portion of it and sort of um, they had some uh, issues with lumping lung and heart together, um, but I think um, the consensus is that we should work a little bit on further uh, sort of providing the rationale for actually doing so, so that we can um, then, uh, you know, study them and get, get to understand the pathophysiology of, of lung allograft vasculopathy a little bit better. Um, so we're planning on resubmitting. Um, the last we spoke about it, um, the idea was flown that we, we submit to American Journal of Transplantation. Um, no other ideas have have popped up, um, but I, I I still have to work on it. I have to sort of expand a little bit more on the lung pathology portion of it and modify it a little bit to sort of incorporate the reviewers' um, comments and and perhaps resubmit um, potentially to the American Journal of Transplantation. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that in the next two weeks, my schedule looks a little bit more manageable and I can actually work on it and, and maybe send it out to the authors for revisions. Excuse me, um, are you going to keep uh, the, the two heart and lung together or are you going to, to split, as you say, some reviewers suggested to... Yeah, so the idea was to keep it together. Um, so the two ideas were proposed after the reviewers' comments. One was just to focus on cardiac, which is the one we have the most information of, on. Um, and then the, the other was to actually to keep it together and sort of further support um, the new unifying terminology. Um, and I think overall it was favored that we just keep them together and just sort of expand a little bit on the rationale as to why we're, we think it's a good idea to actually unify nomenclature involving both of them. So that's so far what we're going to do. Okay. <clears throat> of course, I mean, you know, we'll resubmit and we'll see the feedback and, and rethink if we have to, um, if the feedback continues to be not in support of it. Okay. So I'm hoping in the next, um, not this, in the next two weeks to send it for revisions to the authors, to the co-authors. Thank great. you, Nahia, and thank you for your leadership. That great. was a really great, uh, <laughs> it was, <laughs> it was um, not much time. And you no, put it was it like together. a month and a half or something like that. Yeah. I mean, thank you very much for the opportunity and thank you for all of you, for, you know, all the co-authors for actually doing doing it in such short notice. It was definitely a group effort. <laughs> well, I think so. these kind of uh, things are good for all of us because we actually got together and discussed what what we envision. So I, I think the, these projects are very important. So thank you very much. Any other questions to that one? All right, then let's move on to follow up on the re research proposals from last time. If you remember, last time we uh, discussed uh, a few research proposals for the entire group were brought up. 
And so it would be good to at least see the status of that. And I think, Alex, you are on to talk about yours together with Dr. Lin. Yes. Um, so Thank you. Dr. Lin is currently in Taiwan. And uh, so I am presenting for us. We um, have sent it out to a few of you that reached out. Uh, Anja's team at Mahir is seeing, I think we sent it to Greg as well, um, trying to come up with a spreadsheet of demographics and um, so forth that we want for these cases, kind of. Um, and how we want to define them um, kind of in a first pass. And so um, we've been you know, looking at not only medial inflammation, but also um, intimal inflammation, just to kind of capture a spectrum of these lesions. Um, if you are interested in um, contributing cases or feel like you have some cases, um, we'd love to expand our cohort. Um, we only have about five here at WashU, and I think some of the other centers are going to go back and look through their records. So um, yeah, I can put my email and show you email in the chat. Um, and if you have any questions, um, feel free to reach out. I'll also pre be presenting our five cases um, at ISHLT on Thursday afternoons after session. So um, also, uh, you know, come by and chat with us then um, and we can talk some pathology um, and it'll be great. Very good, thanks, Alex. Does anyone have questions? Yes, can, can we receive a, a short uh, research synopsis about this project? Uh, sure, um, I, can, I can send out um, essentially the abstract and the images, but um, essentially it's um, medium-sized arteries with a medial inflammation that in other, any other setting would be vasculitis, but we think um, is some form of rejection. Um, we just don't quite understand what it is um, because the outcomes are so varied um, and the patient numbers are so small. Okay. Yeah, I wonder, Fiorella, if the question was because of a potential IRB, because <clears throat> I don't know if someone still has to put in to get an IRB for that, then you kind of need a little plurp, you know, by what's sure. the background, what's the aim, and uh, what's the method? Sure, um, that is something I can send out um, to anyone that's interested. <laughs> um, I think we've sent a few of you my abstract, um, and so that would have that information. I'm happy to send that out to anyone else who um, would like it. Yes. Okay, so you. Would be long explants, like for retransplantation, that's the kind of case that you need? We, we were looking more at biopsies. The problem with explants is kind of you know, a lot of those lungs are so shot at that point um, that it's really hard just to find the, the vascular inflammation and also to distinguish it kind of from like A2 um, sort of lesions or like B1R. So we've been focusing mainly on biopsies. We're looking, you know, we're happy to expand into explants. I have a bunch of explants um, that we've looked through. It's just, it's, it's genuinely been hard to find the lesions. And, you know, also like we have a lot more surveillance biopsies than explants. Um, so just the, I feel like they come across more often in the surveillance biopsies. But the, excuse me, is this in some way related to the paper that uh, you were previously mentioning on heart and lung uh, vasculopathy? No, the paper is uh, essentially a review of the pathologic features uh, okay. of heart and vasculopathy okay. and this proposal for a unified nomenclature which is separate from what he's talking about. Okay, okay. Off topic, lung vasculopathy. Well, I think we, we miss a lot of information on lung vasculopathy. I think you in the heart are much more advanced than, than we in the lung. Yeah. All right, very good. Thank you very much, Alex. Appreciate that. Thank you. Let's come to um, Frederica Pesuto neoplasms in explanted native lungs. Unfortunately, Frederica can't be with us today, but Fiorella kindly agreed to do that. Do you guys see the screen or is that still the old screen? I see it. Yes. Good. Please, Fiorella, take it away. So, uh, uh, yes, uh, Frederica is uh, unfortunately out of uh, her office, uh, is a whole holiday. Um, indeed, in Italy, is a carnival. is a very famous <laughs> this period. The, 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 the kids are at home, and they, 
uh, mom usually stay stay with kids. Anyway, this is a research project that Federica, um, one of my closest um, collaborators, uh, presented a few months ago in a previous uh, webinar. The project, this project was founded by our university, Padova University, and um, the ambitious uh, research uh, arises from uh, the uh, attempt to, to find some, uh, some tools that could help us in the diagnosis of uh, uh, this un unpleasure surprise in expand lungs, neoplasia, especially in uh, fibrotic ILD, in particular idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So I think everybody knows that the rate of uh, neoplasia in this uh, in these lungs uh, uh, in the literature has been reported ranging from uh, from two uh, to fifteen, uh, uh, more than fifty percent in our centers. Recently, we updated um, the this uh, this uh, this data and uh, uh, focusing only on idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. The rate is uh, approximately on uh, eleven percent. So. The, uh, the project, then um, can, you, can you go ahead, uh, Anya, just to, to see. So the, 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 um, we have planned, first of all, to evaluate a, a careful uh, morphological and immunohistochemical characterization of, of neoplasia, but moreover, we, we, um, we have to, uh, to, um, to perform a molecular analysis by using a large NGS uh, um, gene panel. Uh, whose uh, results will be then uh, integrated with uh, um, PET CT scan and uh, clinical data and obviously pathological findings. In a subset of patients, uh, will be um, um, the molecular alterations we found in, in, in tissue will be also uh, carefully analyzed in liquid biopsy, um, uh, recruited in uh, our samples because uh, in, um, we started the, the collection of uh, blood spacements in. Um, um, in um, patients suffering from uh, um, ILD, um, at least from uh, um, last year. And um, we have uh, collected uh, um, liquid biopsy and the already extracted DNA because the methodology requires the rapid DNA extraction from, uh, um, from blood samples. Um, please, uh, Vania, go ahead just to, to show the inclusion and exclusion criteria we this uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria have been a, um, a little bit changed these these were the original uh, we submitted to our um, uh, in the our project but uh, recently we have a little bit changed in our um, uh, submission to uh, ethics committee in other words that we will focus on patients with uh, suffering from in general end stage uip usually interstitial pneumonia not only ipf but in general uh, also secondary uip also uip detected in uh, pulmonary um, uh, end stage hp uh, hypersensitivity neonomitis as well as uh, uip in collagen vascular disease in all patients uh, will be uh, performed uh, the NGS in uh, all uh, tissue and uh, in all patients should be available imaging uh, mandatory is a CT scan um, if available also PET CT obviously informed consent and uh, uh, peripheral blood, but this uh, will be investigated in uh, in a subset of patients. But obviously, if the other centers are able to collect blood samples and um, uh, extract DNA, store the DNA in uh, less 80 degree, uh, this will be processed to get our samples, and this should be obviously great. Um, the next one, uh, um, Anya. The, what we need, um, we need uh, at least two paraffin blocks, one coming from neoplasia, um, coming uh, obviously sampled from explant lungs or uh, from biopsy, and one from um, normal or at least quite non-neoplastic, better to say non-neoplastic lung. Um, or uh, alternatively, um, 20 slides from of uh, 10 microns. 
uh, either um, uh, images or uh, blocks will be anonymized before uh, sending uh, to us according MTA. So um, an update about MTA. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have uh, um, the final um, signed document. Um, MTA material transfer agreement is mandatory uh, to, 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 to send us the, the, the material. Uh, usually MTA is uh, written by uh, the PI of, of a project, of a multi-center research project, and then when uh, this is uh, uh, carefully uh, reviewed by legal office and signed, will be sent uh, to the other centers that, uh, uh, that obviously could, uh, could review and agree that the MTA and, uh, and, and signed. So uh, uh, at this time, what I can say that MTA unfortunately are not, uh, not ready. Uh, as soon as the MTA is, is, uh, is ready, I uh, share all, this, all, the, um, pro, all the other partners have already sent me the, 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 the intention to participate to this uh, project. I think there are three, three or four centers that have already sent me the, the intention to participate to this initiative. Uh, all this data, they, we have already um, uh, designed the, the database. The database is in the Red Cup system uh, and include all the items uh, in, uh, in uh, either uh, clinical data and uh, uh, pathological findings and obviously molecular uh, data we, we will uh, um, detect in our uh, investigation. Thank you very much, Fiorella. Does anyone have any questions? I think what, what um, uh, two things. One, the MTA. I mean, yes, you would need an MTA, but I think everyone who sends you these slides or, or tissue blocks or whatever, they need to have their own MTA from their own, um, their own institution. And that will take a while. So I would suggest whoever wants to contribute should start ASAP. Because I mean, for us, it probably takes half a year at least. But usually, Anya, um, uh, the, the MTA is, uh, is written by the, the PI of a project and then sent to the other partners. Uh, and when the legal office of the other partners uh, carefully reading the MTA approved this, this uh, um, will be signed to us. This is usually, for example, the, for a, a research grant uh, um, that I have with uh, a, a European research grant with, that I have with other partners. So the PI usually uh, um, write the, the MTA and send the MTA to the other uh, legal, uh, the legal office of other partners. And the, when approved by the other partners, they, we could start. This is what I, I have experienced with the research grant. Okay, sounds good. The other question I had is, um, if I understood you correctly, you're looking for somatic mutations in these cancers. Are you also looking for germline mutations? No, only, no. Okay. only somatic. Yep. Only somatic. The, the panel included 55 genes, either RNA and the DNA. Cool, thank you. Any other questions? All right, so Fiorella, what, what is the next step? What should we do? Just voice our interest in participating if we, if we have cases or should we... Yes. Stay put now and wait for you well, to. I think uh, you could. Uh, so those who would like to to participate in this uh, this research could start to select the cases, um, because this I think is extremely important. Select the cases. The cases should uh, should be um, interstitial lung disease, fibrotic interstitial lung disease. You have to select the the um, the area of neoplasia and. Uh, far from leoplasia, quite normal lung parenchyma. 
the case should have uh, all clinical information, moreover, should have uh, the CT scan. So I think uh, in the meantime, you could select the paraffin block, the cases. When I, uh, as soon as I, I received the MTA approved by legal office, I sent you, and uh, I think we could start, uh, or you or, or, or the, 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 all the centers would like to join this, uh, this research. I think you could start to select the cases. So maybe I missed that, Fiorella. In regards to the CT scan, I agree it's, it's really important because I think these things are often missed or said it's infection or what have you. Um, who is looking at the CT scan? Do we have our, can we use our own uh, radio, thoracic radiologist to yes. review the CT scan? I mean, I wouldn't probably go by the report because the report usually just says uh, it's either progressive fibrosis or... <laughs> yes, you... you um... What we are doing um, for another project, usually um, the, the, um, the thoracic radiologist uh, in our center um, 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 love to review the, the CT scan um, because uh, we are trying also to apply a sort of uh, AI algorithm to the CT scan. But then I will send you precisely the, 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 the section the radiologist need to uh, to perform then the correlation between the neoplasia and the CT scan. Of uh, they, they require a, a good serial section, but I now I'm 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 I don't know precisely uh, the 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 serial the the the, the scan they the the request to perform the, the evaluation the, to apply the AI algorithm and then uh, correlate with neoplasia. But the, obviously you decide with your thoracic radiologist the, 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 the CT scan and if the CT scan is, uh, the, uh, is available, the acquisition of your CT scan is, uh, is available for um, um, the um, future analysis uh, applying specific uh, AI, um, this should be included in the study. Very good. Thank you. All right, we have seven minutes left. Uh, we'll make sure that uh, Catherine also gets a word. Catherine, do you want to talk about the last study? And uh, I think Elizabeth wanted to say something too. Yeah, I think um, we can open it up to Elizabeth. When we brought this up before, we were talking about intra-observer variability in um, pathologic diagnosis of transplant rejection. And um, we had talked about that that might be a good study for us to do and see what, what um, steps that we could take to increase the intrapathologist um reproducibility from institution to institution or even within the same institution. And um, Elizabeth has been running a study that she, many of us have participated in. So I thought it would be good for her just to give an overview of that study. And that might um, raise some areas where we could move forward into a larger study or possibly come up with uh, mechanisms to increase the reproducibility. So I'll turn it over to Elizabeth. Thanks, Catherine. Um, the work started about 10 years ago, and it is funded by two CTOT studies, which is the uh, clinical trials and organ transplantation for which um, one of the pulmonologists at Duke has been the PI. And the first one involved five North American transplant centers. Um, David Wong, who's on the meeting today, was involved in that one. And the goal of that one really was to look at, um, in a multi-center perspective, observational study sort of fashion, what are the risk factors for CLAD? And there are two papers that have come out showing that acute rejection of lymphocytic bronchiolitis, as well as acute lung injury and organizing pneumonia, the latter in the greater than 90-day time periods, are associated with an elevated um, risk of CLAD. And then um, to follow up on that, there's another CTOT study, which um, Catherine has been involved in. Greg, I know your institution is part of. Um, the other institutions are, let's see, Toronto, Hopkins, 
Cleveland Clinic, Cincinnati Children's, Washington, WashU, St. Louis um, have all been involved in. And this is looking at um, patients who have a histology that is high risk for CLAD, so the four that I just mentioned. And, and um, if they have one of those events, that triggers enrollment into um, a randomized trial where they would receive a ROC2 inhibitor. And so as pre-work for that study, because these high-risk histologies are important, um, I was asked to get together with a group of pathologists from all of the centers that are involved in this and um, talk about our inter-observer variability. And so we started out with a survey where we looked at what of our practice habits and kind of the tricky issues. So like, how do you handle squamous metaplasia in a small airway? Uh, what do you call that? Um, how do you handle acute inflammation um, in a small airway? Do you grade large and small airways for lymphocytic bronchiolitis? Surprisingly, the group was split on that one. And so the survey was really just a practice habits trying to gauge um, where people fell and their criteria to sort of flip the switch to call something acute rejection, lymphocytic bronchiolitis, acute lung injury, or organizing pneumonia. And after that survey, we got together um, seven times for seven one-hour Zoom sessions, and we looked at images of um, normal lung, AR, LB, ALI, and OP. And we just talked through those lesions and what were the tricky areas. Um, and then following that, we had a, a group of 75 digitized slides, which we all scored blindly. And then we looked at uh, how often we agree. And it turns out um, we actually had pretty good agreement after all of that. We did not do anything in the beginning to sort of gauge what our reproducibility was prior to onset. Um, but we're just sort of looking at what's in the literature as far as what's been described. Because it's a, I feel like it's a sore point. Um, frequently at the ISHL team meetings, it seems like our inter-observer variability is um, something that's looked at as being, you know, suboptimal and an area that really needs improvement. So um, I wanted to see, you know, sort of where we were and if it was good, then for this particular study, maybe it removes the need for a central site read and all the pathologists um, at each given center um, can kind of work together. Um, so I don't know if Catherine, you have any other um, things that you wanted to add or Greg, since you've been involved in it, but it might make a nice um, sort of starting block to something that is more broad because it's there. there's certainly a lot more people here than involved in that study. And I think it's, it's needed because there's still areas that are unclear. Elizabeth, if I uh, well understood that, so you means that you are mainly focused on uh, acute, uh, uh, acute lesions in general. So um, I would say the only lesion that isn't sort of acute in nature is the organizing pneumonia. Mm -hmm. you know, okay. okay. Thank more you. of a healing state. But yeah, the, the lesions that we focus on are all ones that um, have been proven to be, you know, associated with an elevated risk of CLAD. Okay. Sorry. So if, some, if I was to be interested in participating in this, um, what would I need to do? So the um, most of the work has been part of a study that was sort of funded and um, just a small group of centers that were part of it. But I think, you know, it's worthwhile to say like, hey, th this was this was good. Maybe we should do something together as a whole, you know, as the pathology community. Um, and I would be happy to be part of that. Catherine, I sounds like you're also seeing a need for that. Um, and I think with revision of the working formulation coming up, it's important for us to kind of have an idea of what where the difficult areas are, where the um, where the guidelines could use more descriptive language to help us. Um, yes, to standardize it. Right. language. Yeah. I don't know, Greg, if you have any thoughts or anybody else that was on that committee, but I thought I I mean I thought it was a very um useful and helpful actually discussion and exercise. Yeah, I think that we after all our discussions, there are certain very specific things that we feel um require more explanation um in, in our in the working formulation. So I think this has generated 
um, very specific things that need addressing. So I, I think with a larger group, uh, it will be useful to hone that. I think so. I think it's it's necessary going into the revision. Yeah. So there's a survey that exists, and maybe that could be, I guess, as a starting point, sent out to everyone just to see kind of what um, comes out of that. And um, the manuscripts that's what I was just referring to that's coming out of this CTAP 47 pathology working group should be submitted shortly. And so that all of those um, issues are, are highlighted in there, at least sort of the top ones. So who would who would uh, continue work on it if we would like to open it up for the group or what would be uh, the vision? Because I really like the concept. I, it sounded it sounded very good to me specifically, you know, talking about practice habits and being surprised what we do, what we don't do, what some people do and what we could do. So I think it would be a great project for the group. Uh, but I was wondering where you see that may, where we may be able to go and uh, who may be interested in heading it and so on. Well, I would think that the next, um, the, the most e efficient next step would be to whenever Elizabeth, if she's willing to share the data with people in the survey, you know, so that we, we'll all be on the same page as to what issues were brought up and um, potentially, because I think there's a potential multiple avenues to move from there. And then once we decide who's interested and who would want to um, participate, we could move forward from there. I mean, I think it would be great if we could pair it with the um, the new guideline revisions. I agree, Catherine, I'd be happy to, to work with you on it. Uh -huh. Yes, uh, I, I hope that all of you have, uh, have given the uh, volunteer addition uh, to collaborate in the update of work information. That sounds great. So thank you very much for, for presenting that, Catherine and Elizabeth, appreciate that. Uh, is there anything else? Any other business before I come to the last slide here, which is the thank you slide for everyone. All right, then hopefully see most of you at the webinar, March 1st, please mark your calendar. And then in, uh, in Prague. All right, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, thank, thank you, you Anya, for great leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anya. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.